Hey, Mark Rodriguez here. You're watching the fight, watching or listening to the fighting podcast. We talk about beat em ups and fighting games. But with me are Ninja Panda 1980 and uh, Ricky Rocks, God of Thunder, Lord of Rock and Roll. Happy to be here as always. Thanks for having me. And Johnny Rodriguez. There we go. And today we're going to be talking about the Ninja Turtles tournament fighters. Uh, now, there's been three versions of game that's an yes version. The uh, Genesis version and the NES version, but we're going to go mostly for the SNES version and, you know, we'll kind of talk about the other two a little bit here. And just to show off, I got my weapons here. Uh, both Ricky and I got Cool Ninja Turtle clothes on, shirts. And oh, he actually has a game behind him, so that's that's epic. And I yeah. still got, I managed to find my old Raphael figure from a 2003 cartoon series and... Leonardo, the Mirage version, whenever Playmates finally woke up and, hey, we should make a Mirage version of these guys. So, you know, there we go. We'll show them off throughout the thing. So, um, oh, yeah, start stuff. things off, the SNES version. I think it came out in, what, like, 94 or something? It came out, like, like near the end of uh, the SNES lifespan, sort of. But it definitely came out near the my end notes, of, like, Eternal Mania. My notes say 93 for the SNES and Genesis, 94 for the NES. That's what my... Uh... Cheat sheet says. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. That was the first game. Whenever Johnny and I moved to Mexico, that was the first game we bought once we moved. And yeah, it makes sense. We, we moved around 93. But um, and that's the thing, though. I like the game. I felt that if it was made a little earlier when Turtle Mania was a bit, you know, because this came out during, you know, the third I've actually moving all that crap. If it came out earlier, we might have gotten a sequel, but who knows. But um, so where do we start off with? Uh, first of all, the most noticeable thing about the game is the roster. Because back then, you know, the cartoon and stuff, you're expecting Ninja Turtle game. Okay, it's going to have, you know, Bebop and Rocksteady and Krang and, and whatever. But instead, we got like Armagon and Wingnut and all these characters. So we're kind of going into the history here because the characters, they really did a bunch of like, you know, grabs them from the toys, grabs them from the, um, the, the Mirage comics, the Archie comics. Those are like a Ninja Turtle Jambalaya, which is kind of cool. And, um, so obviously we got the four turtles and I don't know if you guys want to give your quick thoughts on how they played in the SNES version and everything. Well, you know, you, you really took the words out of my mouth in respect and touched upon what I think is one of the coolest things about the game, even though the roster definitely wasn't, I don't think what anybody expected, but for one thing, the size of the roster was good. You had a good number of characters. With the bosses, you had about a dozen, which is not too bad, especially for a, an originally made game. It's not a sequel or anything like that. So coming out of the gate with 10 playable fighters and two bosses, um, definitely not bad. But you definitely had some deep cuts. Uh, like, for example, you know, uh, you had some of the obvious ones like Shredder or Cyber Shredder, which I never understood what the deal with that was. Yeah. But uh, you had Wingnut. From the Archie comics, you had Karai, who'd only ever been in Mirage up to that point, and only a few of the comics. So she was very obscure to be the final boss. I had no idea who she was when I first played the game. Um, Asuka, who was the big mystery of who that character even was, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on, I'm sure. You mentioned that this game came out around the time of the third movie. There, you know, There's a connection there that we'll talk about. But yeah, you had the four turtles, you had Shredder, you had Rat King. Uh, you know, it, it definitely wasn't the roster I think most fans would have picked. Uh, because again, who you didn't get was just as notable as who you did get. You didn't get playable Casey or Splinter, or Bebop and Rocksteady, or Krang or April. You got some of those characters in some of the other versions. In the Genesis version had a lot of the characters that we wished we got on Super Nintendo. Um, but it definitely feels more than almost any other Turtles game that had been made up to that point, for sure. Uh, all the Turtles games had kind of picked from different parts of the canon. There were Mirage characters that showed up in some of the beat-em-up games, even though the games were based on the cartoon, ostensibly. But, you know, here you had Fred Wolf animated series, you had Mirage and Archie comics, and almost movie characters, we'll come back to that, all coexisting at the one time. So they were really making a game that touched on every piece of history for the franchise going back the previous like eight years, which I think is really cool, quite honest. Or actually, it would have been 10 years since Mirage came out. So maybe that was on purpose, too. 
and the game really does feel like a celebration of everything Ninja Turtles that had been done up to that point. The roster really represents that. So even though it doesn't have the same playable characters as most people would have wanted, I do think it's a good roster and a really good snapshot of like the brand. It's like a it's like a uh, like a very micro snapshot of the brand on a on a macro scale. If that makes any sense. Yeah. So yeah, basically, definitely... um, oh yeah, you won. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna have to agree with Ricky on this one. This one was pretty much like a love letter to the Ninja Turtles fandom in a way because you have characters from the RT series, you have characters from the animated series, and also from the Mirage series. And you've got like one new character, Asuka, who Ricky, I think I know I know what you're talking about. I'm gonna catch up with you on that in a little bit. But um, yeah, it was pretty much like a big love letter to every brand of Ninja Turtles. So it was like, literally, whether you were a Mirage fan or Archie fan, or even if you just watched the Saturday morning cartoons, you knew somebody on that roster, and you were going to have a good time playing it. So definitely agree with Ricky on that. And Johnny, you got to have thoughts on the roster, because, I mean, we all do. It's one of those talked-about things in the game, you know, whether it's the people who were in it or the people who weren't. What do you got to say about that, Johnny? Um, well, I thought it was very interesting, and, you know, most, like, the most average Ninja Turtle fans, you know, we mostly know the Turtles from the, you know, cartoon show. So when you play the game, a lot of people were probably kind of feeling like, who, who is Weeknut? Who is, um, uh, who else is there in the game? Well, you got our Magon, the shark guy. He was interesting. Yeah, Magadon. War. War, all these added extra characters. But it also makes it interesting because then once you actually um, research where these characters come from, you know, from the Mirage comics or from the Archie characters, uh, but it actually makes you um, enjoy the game a little bit more, and it makes it feel like a more complete version of a Ninja Turtle game, and not just based on the cartoon show, you know? It could have easily went the easy route just basing it on the, on the cartoon show, you know, for the most part. Yeah. And um, let me see here. So just real quick uh, synopsis, I guess. Um, so obviously you got the four turtles, and I guess they're just, I don't know, they're a mixture of everything. Um, we've got Shredder, obviously, Cyber Shredder, like but Cyber which again, I don't I don't get that because there was no implication at all that he was a robot or maybe well, he died some, and came back. Here's something I read. It's just a theory because I don't think it's ever really been speculated uh, or confirmed, I should say. It's been speculated on, but not confirmed. The closest I've ever come to an answer on why it's Cyber Shredder in this particular game and not just Shredder is because supposedly this game still follows the same canon of the first few NES and Super Nintendo Ninja Turtles games. So the theory goes that shredder died after turtles in time the real shredder so like he he drank the beauty and becomes super shredder he falls off the roof you see him at the end of turtles in time so he's dead right so this one is either a cyborg or a clone or something to that effect and that's why he's the cyber shredder because for all intents and purposes this game even though it doesn't say so it kind of takes place after that game so if you look at it from that perspective, it kind of makes sense, but the games don't tell you that. The games don't explain that. You're kind of left to just say, why is it Cyber Shredder? So yeah. it's weird. But I mean, he's a big Hulk and bad dude. He's like six foot six, 280. Yeah. Like, you know, they, they did a great, great representation of Shredder in that game, I thought. I just, I, I always wondered what's up with Cyber Shredder. But so that's what I read. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. I don't know. I think it's as good an explanation as any, right? Yeah, one thing I noticed, too, is that I think Torment Fighters came out after either... I can't remember how close they were, but it came out either after or at the same time of Turtles 3... Um, what was it called? Radical Rescue for the Game Boy, where, again, the final boss was Cyber Shredder. But I've never, like, seen the game enough, so I don't know if in that game Shredder looks either normal or there's something cyber about him. So, so it was just, like, a thing, I guess. Real quick, since you mentioned the Game Boy... 
games, there's another connection between SNES Turtles in Time and the Game Boy Ninja Turtles games. Off the top of your head, do you remember what it is? No. The, in the uh, the character portraits during the matches, like the Turtles especially, mm-hmm. uh, they are directly taken from some of the Game Boy games. Like oh. their character sprites Ooh. up in the corner next to their life bar. But all mm-hmm. the characters, their portraits on screen during the fights, they all look like Game Boy style 8-bit portrait graphics. I don't know why that is, but that's a choice to make. Yeah, that, 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 I always forget about it until I play the game again. It's like you can't even really see it, but like over my shoulder here, even, you know, there's the Wii O graphic, and that's oh, definitely... Oh, I see Karai there, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I, I never, I mean, I've noticed a little thing, but I never knew they were based on the Game Boy game. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah it's, another it's, thing to mention is that Shredder looks like his Mirage version, doesn't he? And, and that, like, he's he's all dressed in red, no, no cartoonish cape, you know? He looks like uh, like this dude here. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. And um, there you go. Cyber Shredder. Cyber Shredder figure, right? But um, so let me see here. So themselves, I can't help but notice, too, like the graphical style of the turtles themselves looks almost like it's supposed to be based on the movies. Like the way they're drawn, the head shapes, the length of the bandanas and all of that. It's like the fingernails. Yeah, so in a way, you even had the movie turtles represented in this game, which I thought was really cool. But um, yeah, I remember Asuka. Let's let's talk about that real quick because we yeah. got to get it out of the way. Do you remember what you wondered like the first time you played the game and saw that character? I recognized everybody else, but her, I was like, who is she supposed to be, and where is she from? The one one thing I knew, which of course is, is incorrect, but that's what I thought back then. Was that one time Johnny and I uh, we went to a I don't know why or what or whatever but we went to this random shop that was farther from our regular neighborhood and they had comics and they had a Mirage Ninja Turtle comic that's the first time I ever heard of the Mirage version with Karai on the cover it was the issue where Karai kidnapped uh, Leo and he threw like a like you know an arrow message which is kind of cool because the game did that too. They, they, someone shot an arrow with a note and it said, you know, we got Leo, come talk, meet us, whatever. So that's a cool game reference, you know. But um, so thanks to that, I knew who Karai was. But I also knew that now there's these like more serious black and white turtle comics. So I always assumed, okay, so Asuka must be from there too, from some issue I haven't read. And that was like yeah. my best possible guess because I had no idea, you know, she wasn't in a cartoon, obviously. So I'm like, it wasn't Archie either, right? So I'm like, yeah, she must be a little... Mirage character. Maybe she worked for Cry. I don't know. <laughs> you know, that was my the best longest, guess back then. For the longest time, I thought I missed something, like an episode of the cartoon or or an issue of one of the comics, right? But then, now I know that uh, Ninja Panda probably has heard the story. Oh yeah, he's, he's just blowing up to tell us. <laughs> Go <laughs> ahead, dude. So, what have we learned since then about this character that at the time we had no idea who she was? And it's a really interesting story. Let, let's talk about that. What have we learned? Okay, so from what I've learned, around the same time, Ninja Turtles 3 was coming out. Now, Konami had to kind of save face because there was a certain character from that movie, particularly Mitsu, who was in the original Tournament Fire build. Now, of course, we all know, movie flopped critically, and, you know, by oh, everybody else. Oh, did Oscars? Hmm? <laughs> It didn't win any Oscars? Nope. Nope. If anything, it got slapped harder than Chris Rock and Will Smith. Oh. But, so, to say, so for Konami oh. to uh, save face, <clears throat> they decided to change the character's name to Asuka and made her a character who was trying to create her own ninja school. So, yes, Asuka is actually Mitsu from Ninja Turtles 3. And of course, we must all mention, because we are all gentlemen of culture, we must all mention that uh, in the SNES, no, the, um, how should I say, the Japanese version, which for whatever reason was called TMNT, and he was called Mutant Warriors instead of Tournament Fighters, um, Asuka was wearing basically pretty much a thong. So then, so then cheats be out, you know, when she's doing her spinning, her uppercuts and all that. But in the SNES version, they gave her more of a bikini bottom type thing. So, you know, it's covered up. Now, the weirdest thing is, and this is like, I don't know, attention to detail or something. Um, 
every character in the game, except for, I think, Karai and Rat King, all their win pulls, as you notice, is taken from some frame that they already have. Some, you know, like, like Rav has an uppercut and his win is that uppercut pose, you know, stuff like that. I think Rat King and Karai actually have different poses. But, but Asuka, for whatever reason, in the Japanese version, they gave her a completely different redrawn pose where she spins and then boobies be bouncing. Which is just funny because, okay, so why her? Why did she get the special treatment, right? But yeah, they gave her a, a new animation of her spitting and, and, you know, bouncing them jugs. While in the SNES version, it was just like a, like a frame, one of her frames when she does the, uh, her spitting attack or something like that, which is interesting. Yeah. Well, for various I, I, reasons. Another, uh, another change, I really want to track down the Japanese version because I found out that when you're fighting the Rat King, on the Japanese version, you can break through the walls of the Channel 6 studio and extend the play area. I don't know why they took that out for the American version, but that would have been a really cool thing to have. So since I got the uh, cartridge converter and I've been playing some old uh, Shin Nippon, Zen Nippon wrestling games lately, I'd love to get the Japanese tournament fighters and uh, just mess around with that for a while. Because uh, I like when there's those little differences, but I also kind of feel like left out. You know, because it always almost seems like they get the better stuff and we get, like, the watered-down stuff. I don't know why they would take something like that out, like, breaking through the wall and stuff. Because I, I remember feeling like you could or should be able to do that, but then you can't. But then it turns out you could, but only over there. So that was weird. Yeah, you get this new scene with, the like, all the TV screens and the people that do the, the editing, like, like they were there, you know? And, um... Yeah, that, yeah, that, that seems, you know, it's so weird to me. It always felt like, it felt like you should have been able to break through that back wall but you just couldn't do it and now i know when was the first time you guys saw heard about or played the game let's talk about that because this thing I was mean, kind of a surprise. for me pretty much because you know game pro and egm talked about it coming soon so we had we were still in mexico so we had to find some way to order and bring it over we had some dude that i guess every other weekend he goes to the States for whatever the hell reason. So it's like, yeah, give, give me a couple of bucks and I'll get it. And he brought it. And yeah, Giant and I basically played the fuck out of it. Like, like nonstop. Oh, so correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I think in the Mexican arcade store, because they have that system where, I don't know, arcades were starting to fade out. So they were still having that system where you could rent the SNES thing. Like they have their big screen TV. And could play their SNES game and just pay like rent, you know, every half an hour or whatever their their building was. Building, yeah. sorry. So then they had the tournament fighters there as well. Yeah, I think so. But you know, obviously what we had at home, we kind of ignored before. it. But we saw kids playing it and whatever. Yeah, that was like my first time seeing a game like in person, and and I was. My first impression of the game I said, "Holy shit, this is like like the Ninja Turtle game." And the game looks really good. The graphics look pretty good. Um, it looks like it, it's um, pretty much like their version of Street Fighter 2. And, you know, in that time, uh, there were many games that were trying to copy Street Fighter 2. But for some reason, those other franchises, they never were able to, um, I don't know, copy it that good. I guess the closest... In my opinion, would probably be World Heroes, maybe. Yeah. But um, but in terms of the turtles, like it's 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 so obvious that this is like a, whether intentionally or unintentionally, but a very direct competition versus you know the Street Fighter Two series. You know, like just just the way the game looks, just the way the game plays, and everything. Yeah. And I have to agree. Um, there are quite a few uh, animation sprites. If you look carefully, you can tell they've been taken from, you know, even some of the Street Fighter games. Like if you pick Michelangelo and use his like low fierce kick, he actually does like a spin and then he low kicks and slides and it looks exactly like Vegas. Um, he even does like the roll like Vega does where he just kind of bounces off of the character rather than just rolling across the floor and then going in for a stab. Um, Guar, I mean, Guar is, he's more or less, he's Blanca. He's yeah. just, he's freaking Blanca. Dead. Yeah. 
Chrome just without the shocks. Much, he's blown. Chrome Dome's pretty much so, down. Yeah, I, you know? they got oh, that same, energy. They got a lot of the same vibe with a lot of characters. Chrome Dome is is basically their answer to Dalsim, and uh, you know, there's definitely that heavy Street Fighter inspiration there. I think this one does it better than a lot of the other games that try to do that. It just it feels uh, like they didn't just copy the gameplay, but refined it, polished it. Like I, I mean, we'll talk about the gameplay in turn. Right now, we're mostly doing first impressions, but you know, a lot of games ripped off or copied Street Fighter Two. I don't think too many of them, or maybe any of them, did it as well as this one did. But that's my opinion. Yeah, and one thing I think I said in earlier podcast or whatever, this was the best ever um, SNES from the ground up fighting game, I think. All the other ones like Fury 2 and World Heroes and those, I mean, they were, you know, and Mortal Kombat 2, of course, they were awesome, but they were based on arcades. But, you know? but you're telling me, you're telling me that Justice League Task Force isn't up there? You're telling and, me that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't that bad. But I mean, if I'm talking in comparison to like balls and Shaq Fu and clay fighters, yeah, and, you it, know. it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that good, though. I mean, you had better than goals. history fighters. Oh, you know, fighter history. I mean, fighters history. Yeah. The game's so bad. No, so so plagiarized that Capcom tried to take them to court over it. Even the versus thing was copied, like the character portraits, everything. But uh, Panda didn't tell me about how he first found out about or played the game, though. That that's right. Okay, so how I found out about the game, oddly enough, was I was in a comic book store. I think I was reading. What was I reading? It was actually one of the uh, Archie Ninja Turtle comics. And on the back of it, there was just like this, you know, this little promo, you know, one of their little promos talking about the tournament fire game. I was like, okay, well, this looks pretty cool. I guess I'll check it out. So, of course, hop myself over the Blockbuster, pick up a copy, mine have been blown ever since. And, and that was literally my first experience with it. Um, I think... That was actually the first time I actually took a game back to Blockbuster late because I, I just needed one more day. Because, <laughs> again, Cry was whooping my tail, but I had a lot of fun with it. I remember, I couldn't describe it now because I haven't seen it in so long, but I found out about it with the television commercial that they made for it. Hmm. Um and I don't remember, again, you'd have to look it up on the YouTubes, but it was a really cool, atmospheric commercial. It made the game seem like a big deal and really serious. And as you mentioned, it was kind of on the tail end of the franchise's peak. You did mention that, and that's true, because the peak was like 1990, and this was 93, going into 94. So it was already definitely on the downward slope. But at the same time, with it being the 10-year anniversary of the entire franchise and everything, I think the, the game was uniquely placed to be a celebration of all things Ninja Turtles, which is what it ended up being, you know, which is cool. So a game like that came along at the perfect time. And I remember the commercial, and it was out already. I wasn't reading the magazines as religiously back then as I would later on, so I hadn't read about it. In fact, I read about it in a magazine called Game Players later that month because they actually reviewed the uh, Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo versions. So uh, I went out after I saw the commercial. I went to the rental store. They had it. I brought it home. I think I did the three-day rental. And I've mentioned to you guys a hundred times, it's cool you guys even have me on here because I'm far from a fighting game guy. I play them, I mess with them, I'm not great at them, and I wouldn't say they're my favorite, but I definitely have played a lot of them and spent a lot of time on many. So I played that one more than I'd played any because it was Ninja Turtles. It was never good at Street Fighter, uh, was nah, okay like we talked about at Mortal Kombat, but this game, because it was Ninja Turtles, it made me really knuckle down and really play it a lot and really try to get good at it and figure it out. So... Over time, I did, even though I got to say it's one of the hardest friggin' fighting games I've ever played, and we'll talk about that in its turn, because I think that's maybe the only bad thing you can say about it, is the game is ridiculous. However, 
Um, I was still blown away by it. I just kept pushing, pushing, pushing. I was eventually able to beat Karai. I don't think I ever played it on the hardest, but I know I beat her at at least level three. Um, I was all about it. I even, the manual, God, the artwork in the manual was so cool. I, after I'm in between playing the game, I get bored of playing the game and I'd start copying the drawings in the instruction manual, like them doing their super moves and everything. Cause it was just so cool. I think I still have some of those colored pencil drawings somewhere. God, but yeah, it, uh, it, it was just like Mortal Kombat, it was a, for completely different reasons. It was a game that drew me in and made me play it over and over and over again, despite the fact that I'm not the fighting game guy and I'm not even really great at it. And, uh, you know, first impressions were high. Uh, the game looks fantastic. I mean, we'll talk about each of these things in turn, but I mean, I love the way it looked. I liked that I could at least play it a little bit, not get completely crucified. And, um, I think really does a great job of capturing the atmosphere because not only does the roster pull from all the different versions of Ninja Turtles, but even the characters who aren't there as playable characters are still there. Like, let me check my notes here, my cheater notes. Like, you got the neutrinos show up on the Chrome Dome stage at the art museum. Uh, you got Baxter Stockman and Casey Jones when you're fighting Donnie in the scrapyard section. You know, so you got Bebop and Rocksteady show up in the background on, uh, I think, the Mount Olympus stage. Uh, so it's like, more, I think, than any other Ninja Turtles game, it really just has a little bit of everything. So that was, like, one of my first impressions. was like, wow, this game really, really, the people did their homework, and they really did a great job as far as, like, doing the stuff you expected, but also the deep cuts and, and putting it together in a way where even if you didn't play fighting games and you just like Ninja Turtles, you could definitely appreciate it and have a lot of fun with it. So uh, I, I, I rented that game often. I never got good at it. I bought it eventually, but yeah, I never got great at it. But when I always come back to it, a couple of years I come back to it. So for the other characters real quick, the ones that aren't obvious and we already explained about um, Asuka, um, so let me see. So Armagon was actually a mutant shark from the future in the Archie comics. Yeah. That was kind of cool. The only thing that kind of bugged me, because I you know I'm kind of a purist here and there. They made him spit out the <coughs> spiral water things. When in the comics he shoots missiles from his shoulder things. That that could have been his projectile, just shoot the fucking missiles out, you know. Um War was weird because War was actually one of the uh, horsemen of the apocalypse in the Archie comics, but in the game, they made him like either a mutant or an alien, or and he just talks kind of, you know, in that kind of like, like, must stop turtles, you know, like a guy that can barely speak. While in the comics, he, you know, he talked normally and everything. Yeah. And that was a yeah. weird pick. Yeah. Like, like we'll movie. choose one of these random guys from the apocalypse, ah, uh, that one or something for the game. That was like the most weirdest pick of like a character, you know? Yeah, that yeah. game version of him was pretty much happen if you bought a group from Wish. Like, that's basically what would happen. <laughs> and I'm not sure, but he was a dollar he store group on that. Shoots game. off like the parts of him, like the stone things in the comics, which would have been a projectile for the character. He was he was one of those non-projectile characters in the in the game. I, War is like, let's be honest, he it can't be just me. I think he's the shits. I think War is the worst character in the game. He's kind of like like Guile in the sense that he only has two special moves. I think all he has is the uppercut and the uh, land from above. And it was so weird because everyone else had at least three moves, and he only has like two, I think. Like, he's slow as shit. He can only jump straight up, really. He can't jump up and forward, which, you know, like, like he, he's the one character where even when I mess with the harder difficulties and whatnot, which I rarely do, but like if you can't beat war then something's wrong like he's the shits like i don't know to me he's the worst in the game he's he's really easy so it's like a lot of the other characters piss me off so when i get to fight him i'm like okay good i get to take a break for a minute and i can just fucking it's like i usually play leo most of the time this is my favorite he's got the best reach i think or at least he's up there uh he's pretty much most well balanced than me we'll talk about that but uh so i just use like the diving splash leg sweep on war and you can pretty much just spam that and take him out in, like 20 seconds he's he's a piece of shit i don't know who, who what do you guys think who, who was great who's the shits 
I mean, the, the thing is, I played that game so much. I just loved everyone. But War is like the most lacking. He needed like one more special or something. But um, War and Wingnut, I think, are bottom tier as far as I was g- glad to have Wingnut in there. He was one of the first Archie characters they introduced in the comics. So it was cool seeing him in there. But yeah. he sucks too, I think. Wingnut, his, his portrait is almost like a panel for one of the Archie comics. Yeah, yeah, they so which is kind of clever them. and everything. Um, the thing I like about Wingnut though is that he, um, well, his his normal attacks are like multi hit. He has like um, you know handstands and spinning, and that's his regular attack. So that's kind of you know that's cool. And uh, his super actually like can cross up. If you jump right behind someone in the right moment, like it'll hit you, and you, you can't block because the bombs are blowing up behind you where you can't block. So that's pretty. That's pretty cheesy. And yeah, he was in Archie Comics. I know he appeared in other incarnations, but this one was definitely based on the Archie Comics version. And where he was, I think he was from Dimension X and Krang destroyed his home planet. Yeah. And everything, so it was after Krang. Um, yeah. Let me see it's here. Oh, Chrome Dome was, I'm assuming, based more on the cartoon or the action figure. I forgot if the episode was already out at that time or not. But um, I think it, yeah, I think so. the, the funny thing about him was he in the in the cartoon version, um, Shredder wanted to create a mini technodrome and he wanted to make an extra robot that would be smart enough to order the other foot soldiers to, to do it. You know what I mean? They made him out of adamantium, which I don't know how they got that past Marvel, but they made him out of adamantium and they ran out just as it has a, an exposed weak spot on his back. So it's kind of like, well, what is his regular steel? They'll never know. And of course, as they kidnapped April and April was there, she was listening. She knew so she could tell the turtles like, guys, I know their weak spot or whatever, you know. And the funny thing about if you guys haven't played yet, slight spoiler or whatever for Shredder's Revenge, that actually factors in. Chrome Dome is one of the bosses. He's invincible and you can only hit him when he's exposing his back. Any other time, don't waste time just to avoid him because you, you can't do anything to him. He blocks everything, you know? But it's cool. You can only hit him when his back is exposed. And I'm like, dude, that, that's fucking clever. That's like attention to detail, yo. You know what I mean? Johnny, who who, who did you think was the shits in tournament fighters? Well, kind of like what you said, I think Leonardo's like the most um, balanced of all the turtle characters i kind of equate him to um a ryu and ken type of character in the game um i also like Raphael. i, I like my, uh, michelangelo but but definitely i think if, if you want to play the game and i have you know play the game a little bit like hassle free i think leonardo's a character to choose but, who's the but i do one, like though? all the other characters like their um like their gimmicks their style, their personality. Um, one thing I, I also want to add is I actually like the the art style. I like the background, the stages. I like the oh, sound. Oh yeah. Oh it's yeah. Fantastic. I mean, considering that this is of culture. an original, an original fighting game that's not in the arcade, you know, format. Um, it's it's impressive. Like the the soundtrack is pretty awesome. I mean, of course, it is a little bit limited because it's very short, but it's short and sweet. Yeah, but oh, the animation in those backgrounds, like, you know, people waving and cheering and all of that. I mean, you know. And I like I like the concert stage. Yeah. Oh, there's so much going on. Awesome. There's and so the lights much. are blinking and all that. Oh, yeah. They really, really did a fantastic... Visually, the game's, to me, a 10. Uh, if I would change anything... It would be the character portraits, since they literally look like Game Boy sprites. I would change that, but everything else to me is a 10 out of 10. I mean, yes, it's 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 pixelized. It was 1993, but I mean, like, I don't think 16-bit graphics get better than this game. I really don't. Uh, it's fantastic. It really is. Uh, being a man of culture, as you alluded to, Mark, I couldn't help but notice as a man of culture, that Callow, when she shows up in the background on the, the art museum stage, she was a lot more buxom than she ever was in the cartoons. Oh, yeah, they gave her, they gave her more of a, of a figure, you know. But, but obviously, only a true man of culture will notice such a thing. You know? Like, on the show, she always say she's 10 years old. In the, in the game, she looks like a prostitute. Wow. With a bad haircut. Oh my god. So anyways, we've got uh this is the OBRY version. We can say prostitute. Anyways, uh we got Wendy on the line there. 
Panda didn't tell me who's the bottom tier, who's who's joke in this game, according to you. Because like I said, I got War and and uh, and Wingnut at the bottom of my list. So Panda, who do you think sucks the big one? Okay, so my bottom tier, my bottom tier two are actually is weird because we got the same ones, Wingnut and War. I mean, let's face it, War is pretty much a Looks like a dollar store version of Groot, and he's pretty much a copycat of like Wonka. Uh, I mean, he's pretty. I mean, he pretty much just does like the same, the same amount of high press, jumping around, a uh, bit of a rolling attack. The only difference between him and Blanca is he's got this grab from anywhere version of like Kin's Hell Wheel. Uh, yeah. If you pay close attention to it. But all you got to do is you can basically take him out Mortal Kombat style. If you just do fear the whole time, he's pretty much done for. You so, still yeah, and War and Winglet are my main two that just. Yeah. It's like for War, if you, want, if you do anything at all, he won't hurt you. If you stand still and let War throw you around with that rolling grab throw, then you might have a problem. But it's like if you do literally anything, he just lets you do it. <laughs> yeah. So we got Wendy here. She came in a bit late there. Um, how's it going there? Say hi to your fans. <laughs> hi. Yep. And uh, so just real quick to ask you some of the things you might have missed is how did you first hear about tournament fighters? And um, I guess what's your like stronger and, and like worst characters of the game so far? Um, for me? Yeah. But here's the thing with me is, unfortunately, I only played it as a rental. It was only, like, for a weekend. And the only reason I knew about tournament fighters is because we went to the video store, which was a movie time, and we just rented games. So that was the only, that was the, my only exposure to it. I didn't know anything about it prior because I didn't really read gaming magazines. I didn't keep up with, like, shows focused around gaming because I don't think they actually really existed so much, you know, back then. So I couldn't tell you. The only thing I really remember, because it was an SNES version, because I had an SNES. I forgot what my cousin ran it because she had a Genesis. But... I like I said the big the big um the big sprites. I do remember that. Oh, I remember yeah. like it seemed like they had like the detail to them, and I liked that I used Raphael. <laughs> so I can't remember, but that's because I had a bias against Raphael because I like he was my favorite turtle for the show. After my along with Michelangelo, those sprites, man, the sprites on that game take up a third of the screen. I mean, how can you not love that? Like, yeah. It's beautiful, beautiful stuff. Like, and that's one of the benefits of being a game built for the ground up for the Super Nintendo. Whereas Street Fighter II, Mortal Kombat, we played at home. We got these kind of watered down versions where the sprites were smaller, the music wasn't as good because instead of being built from the ground up, they took something big and smashed it down. Whereas here, being developed for the SNES. They were able to maximize everything to the fullest, the music, the graphics, the controls, everything. Since it wasn't adapting, but being built specifically for that hardware, oh, man. I mean, it just looks so fantastic. The, the sprites are so big, and they move so well. It's like, oh, man. And, like, we talked about the background graphics, uh, the stages, you know. You've got characters moving around. You've got lights flashing. You've got little details, like, uh, in Leo's stage in the back alley, when you went around, the poster winks at you. It's like, oh, yeah. It's ridiculous, but how can you not love that, you know? Or, or there's also that chick who's got to be a hooker. Uh, you know the one. She's standing there. She's in her brown underwear, the redhead, blonde, strawberry blonde redhead looking chick. She's just standing there in his alley watching you guys have a fight. So like, yeah, there's your walking around clothes. I mean, it's, I it's city, you know. <laughs> oh. Oh, so man. um let me see what I was gonna say. Game. Oh yeah, one of the, the other weird details on the Japanese version compared to the American version, which is kind of weird, is um if you guys notice in the SNES version, the, the turtles in particular, the four turtles, like for some weird reason, 
two of their special moves, they have like a more lighter pitched voice. It sounds similar to the voice they would use in like Turtles in Time and all that. Because, you know, it's, just, it's a, some random guy. It wasn't like Rob Paulson in them. It was someone voicing the Turtles, right. right? So two of their specials, they would say it in that voice. And then two of their other specials, they would say it like in this gruffer kind of voice. It's kind of weird, you know? Like Donatello, uh, I'm trying to remember... I can't remember him. Uh, Michelangelo, for example, his uppercut, he'd he, he still be like, like, rising thunder, you know? But then, like, his fireball, he'd be like, dragon breath, like, what the hell? But in Japanese version, all their voices were like that lighted voice for them. So in the Japanese version, he would be saying, like, like dragon breath or something instead of, like, the, the gruffier voice. And that was kind of a weird, like, why? I don't understand like the reason why, you know, this weird, but okay, you do you guys, but I think I read about that, but I mean I never played the Japanese one, so I wouldn't know. But I think I think that's one of those things I just came across in my many, many travels. Yeah. The advantage is that the uh that upcoming Colorbunner collection is gonna include a Japanese version. So hopefully we'll still see the the breakaway backgrounds and ask to show them cheats. Well there you the guys forgot about fans. That. I forgot about that. That's pretty cool, man. I'm actually looking forward to that among many, many reasons, but that's definitely a big one. Um, yeah, that's that's going to be cool because, like I said, I never played the Japanese one. I also never played the Genesis version. I played the NES one once. Um, I, wait, then, I would love to know your experience with the NES version because until this moment, I didn't even know there was an NES version. Just well, SNES people- and Genesis. It's funny, we talked about that a little bit during the pregame show before we went live here. Uh, A lot of people didn't know about the NES version because it came out in 94. The NES was dead. And there weren't any other real fighting games for the NES in the first place, so there wasn't a strong audience of fighting game fans on that console to begin with. But I guess they figured, you know, we already made these other two versions. So it's okay. Uh, I don't have the list in front of me of like what characters are in it. I don't remember there being very many. Uh, nobody well, any yes. It was just the Turtles, Shredder, Casey, and Hothead. Right, yeah, and Hothead was like... He was the only new, like, you know, any as only character. He's also based on the Warrior Dragon from the Archie comics, but the action figure line called him Hothead and everything. Yeah. And due to the NES limitations... You can't have like a hothead versus hothead match or something. Right. You, know? you can game genie it, but the game will like glitch out and freeze or something. Because he yeah. just he used up so much of the memory for the NES to yeah. run the game. I the only thing I remember was that Shredder had like the movie version of the mask with the extra like I guess breathing holes or whatever the fuck that, that yeah, was. The mesh. Yeah, with the mesh. Yeah. There was uh, there was only those couple characters, nobody had weapons. Every once in a while, there was like a ball you could pick up that would let you do a special move, like throw a fireball or something. But um, it was okay. It was it was a fighting game on NES. It was okay. Like I said in the pregame, I just wish that I bought it when I had the chance because now it's worth like $1,000 or some shit. But back then, my buddy rented it. We played it for an afternoon. We're like, nah, it's okay. And... Neither one of us thought it was anything to spend money on ever again. So I saw it for sale at Toys R Us for clearance prices, like 20 bucks or whatever. Didn't grab it. Turns out nobody else did either because it's one of the rarest <laughs> NES games. Go figure. Yeah. But yeah, people that's, that's, get to play that finally with the collection coming out too. So that's that's, cool. that's how I feel about Conquered Bad Fur Day. I really wish I would have gotten a copy of that game back then because... I don't know. I, I got a copy of Conker's Bad Fur Day for nine ninety nine at Toys R Us on clearance. Oh, God. I'm well, still kicking myself for that. On clearance. That game sucks. I'm sorry. I oh, no, I wasn't into the game. I just wish I had it because I rented it. I couldn't get into it. I wish I would have bought it anyway because I was, I, was I was thinking about getting it at the time. I rented it. I used my little little bit of pizza money that I had from studying all week with my college classes, you know. It was, it was a, for 10 bucks, I don't really regret it. It had its moments, but that game was more hype than actual goodness i i I don't know i thought it was more annoying in a lot of parts than anything but but that's me so but yeah we we talked about guys we thought were the shit so one or two of us talked about our favorites i'll talk about mine real quick because you know i talked about a little bit leo 
I like because, as you said, he's more like the Ryu of the series in a way. He's very well-rounded. Um, he's got great reach. In the tournament mode, you build up that super move by landing strikes, whether they're blocked or not, right? So uh, the fact that you can hit people with Leo just with his fierce punch attack from anywhere on the screen almost is really cool. It comes in handy. He's got a good anti-aerial with that little flash kick thing he does. That's really yeah, cool. The, um... He's got the uh, shining cutter. Yeah, there you go. With the fireball, you know, he's got a he's got a lot of really good attacks. Very well balanced, and uh, uh, he's got my favorite super move in the game. That Millennium Wave thing with the four thousand fists or whatever the Japanese version yeah. called, it, where he shoots those blue fists of energy all over that is so cool man so yeah he's the guy i play as the most but who who's your favorite who do you play as the most oh i also like mikey a lot because of that sweep that sliding sweep kick thing but yeah he's cool too but he's a little yeah he's not as good as leo to me but who are some of your favorites i'm just thinking right now um if it was more like anime based with leo throwing all the punches i can imagine <laughs> like 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 kenshiro <laughs> throwing the punches and all that Oh man, um, yeah, I like when almost he all of them. Around, you see, like seven cool. scars on his shell. Oh god, yeah. Uh, Leo's pretty cool. Michelangelo, I like Michelangelo because he had that SNK style beat you up super, where he just yeah. dashes at you, beats the crap yeah. out of you, like he was real I Robert. I like that. I love that. Yeah, and um, you know and me. Oh, sorry. Um. This, uh, the other two favorite characters, I would probably say Asuka. I like Asuka because of her speed. I like how, like she's quick enough to just jump in and throw you like that without the character having much of a chance to do anything ab- about it. And I also yeah. like Shredder because Shredder's kind of like, like his supers, I mean, his specials are just like a rising knee thing and bouncing back to projectile. That's all he has. But he plays so well. Like his all his basic attacks, he's basically like the, like the Ryu and Ken of the game. But without having, you know, Leo swords or whatever, you know. So he plays like Ryu and Ken, and I like that. So he's kind of a clever character to use. You know, he's not like that obvious. He doesn't have, you know, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't do super cheesy shit you expect. He's Shredder. He's the bad guy. Okay, he's gonna have a fucking screen building fireball or some <laughs> cheesy shit. He plays his specials are kind of basic, but his regular attacks more to make up for it though. It's pretty. Oh, I love doing the. Uh, the rising knee thing, and while the character's blocking, throw them. Like, it's yeah. so epic, you know? Panda, I don't think you chipped in. I know Johnny chipped in his favorites. What are some of yours? Um, William or me? I mean, like I, I said, Panda. I didn't play enough. Okay, because like I said, I didn't play the game enough to get any favorites. So, yeah. And if I were to choose anyone out of the main four turtles anyway, I probably realistically like how i am now i would probably like someone like don like donnie or leo because like i said because leo is always the well-rounded character but i like donatello because of the reach but he's usually a little slower but eh, that's just me donnie's a little weak against aerials i noticed he's he's kind of easy mm-hmm. to come down on from above and he loves to spam that ground claw like a motherfucker like that's his favorite thing to do is growl claw growl claw it's like oh yeah i don't know how to jump just keep doing that <laughs> by all means just keep doing that so i can drop a knee on you and then sweep the leg sweep the leg johnny <laughs> yeah I, I i asked panda uh because i don't think he's i don't think he chipped in on that one before yeah um so my favorite character my favorite my favorite two were actually leo and mikey because Leo, you know, you pretty much, he's your all-arounder. Like, he's the, I guess as we call, like, in the video game world, the Shoto of them all. So, like, he's the Ryu character. So, you know, you've got your, you know, basic set of moves that super looks freaking incredible. Like, I was telling Mark, it, it looks like when he's done, he should, like, turn on his back and there should be, like, seven stars, like, on his back, like, from Kim from Fist of the North Star, as I was just. But... Um, yeah, he's definitely got a good move set. Uh, Mikey, Mikey has like a little bit of a Vega in him, uh, especially with that, like, fear, again, that fierce sliding low kick, which you can actually combo into his, like his roll, his raising rolling attack. And you can pretty much spam those back and forth 
with no drop in like the frame data. So you could just go one, two, one, two, one, two constantly and just bury somebody in the match if they're not blocking it right. So those are my main two guys. Yeah, I usually play Leo, but Mikey is the other one I think I've had the most success with because uh, some of those moves, like, they really come in handy. I'm not great at the ones where you have to charge first, like the ones where you have to, like, hold back and forward and Mm -hmm. do the thing. I'm not great with those, but, I mean, he's got so many other cool attacks that, you know, whenever I got in trouble with Mikey, I would just spam that, that sliding sweep. That got me out of a lot of trouble many a times and like mark said his finishing move where he just comes in and beats the crap out of you and finishes it with that rising thunder like whoo that's good shit pal um i didn't play his wrath a lot but i do like his attacks i like how he just comes up and german suplexes you right on your fucking head i think that's awesome um, I like his uh, little cartwheel kick gimmick. I like the screw. I think that kind of harkens back to, uh, I think, uh, Turtles 3, the Manhattan Project. Yeah. Well, I think they gave him that as a, as a special move. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, no, 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 you're right. So that that's a nice little throwback, right? And uh, yeah, they did stuff like that with a lot of the characters. Like Leo, he does the end with screw, and he does a screw attack in the beat em up games too. So it's like, there's that, that carryover, that synergy there that I thought was really, really awesome. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, who, who are some guys that you just hate, hate having to fight against? Like every time they come up, you're like, mom, fucker. Like, Cause there's always at least one. I don't like Chrome dome. No, uh, he, he spams the electric power driver any chance he gets and the higher the difficulty the more that's kind of like don't even don't even get close to him because yeah. he'll just grab you out of nowhere. I mean, you were talking about how he kind of jumps at you a couple of, like take advantage of that because those are the times you can actually hit the fucker when he kind of jumps at you and you the can only, knock him out of the air or whatever. But the only time I can beat Chrome Dome successfully on higher difficulties is when I just tap back over and over again. I don't get near him. Maybe I'll lash out with the sword and he'll block it and that'll help me build up my super move. But I'll just lure him in with that, tap him, tap him, keep backing up. He'll jump, and he'll jump into the high kick, because Leo's got that awesome high kick. If I can just trick him into doing that, there's been times where he'll just do nothing but that the whole fight. Jump, high kick, jump, high kick. Any other way, I get slaughtered. But if I can get him into that pattern and I can get him locked into that, I can kill him. Otherwise, he's a fucking pain in the ass. You're right. Yeah. Freaking Chrome Dome, man. That's all I can say. Just, I cannot stand that character. It almost got to the point that I would get the Chrome Dome and I'd just be like, okay, I did a good enough job for tonight. Click, turn it off, walk away. <laughs> At least he has the courtesy to tell you to get out before he self destructs. <laughs> <laughs> That's his thing. He blows himself to smithereens. That's cool. Yeah, like, if he could do that before the match, that would be great. <laughs> no, that's definitely – he's one of those guys where I literally stood up and flipped off the screen. Like, that's it. I've done that a couple times with this game. Not going to lie. That, no, see, that just makes me – see, with you saying that, that's how I felt about the dog and duck hunt as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all had that. Everyone John, always asks the question, can you shoot the dog too? Yeah, but I kept trying. Didn't work. Johnny, who who did you hate to fight? It's, it's going to be Chrome Dome. I think he's just freaking annoying. It's cheesy, you know. Obviously, um, the most obvious annoying character is going to be the final boss, because Karai is, you know, Karai. But, um, She's a pain in the that, That's what I'm dealing with now. I'm going to try it again when we're done. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Now, one thing about the game also is the story, which is interesting, is the game actually has two stories. It has uh, one storyline if you're playing the traditional arcade-type thing, and another story if you're playing the story mode. In the arcade version, Channel 6, I guess, is announcing this big tournament and stuff, and this is when the Turtles find out that, holy shit, Shredder's, like, signed up in that, so let's let's do shit about that, you know? So they enter the tournament for that, and it's just pretty much the story, I guess, but then, like, after you beat everyone, apparently the Rat King was the former champion. Um, 
Okay, <laughs> you know, so the, the former champion comes to challenge you and you got to beat him. Then after you beat him, all of a sudden, Karai just crashes the party and you got to beat her. And of course, April Neil Pierce, she interviewed, like everyone's win pull in the game. It's basically April asking you and they say their, you know, their thing and stuff like that. And yeah, it's, it always looks funny seeing April standing like right there up to Shredder, Rat King, Karai. Yeah. Like, you know, they, they might kill me, but I got to get that story. You know? Tell us your thoughts. That was, yeah, like, like you said, you've got, you know, uh, Rat King is the defending champion, which I'm, I'm sure there's a story there. It's like, but we're just, okay, let's just roll with that. Um, you know, like you said, she's kind of just cozying up the shredder. Like, what are your thoughts on this victory? But uh, one thing I really liked is if you watch the attract mode for long enough, uh, they show you the little bio pages for all the characters and everybody's got their own motivation for joining the tournament. And I thought that was really cool. Like uh, uh, Asuka, she wants to, I think, open up her own dojo or something. Leo, yeah. he, he just wants to prove he's the best fighter as usual. And then Raphael, he wants to buy presents for all his friends. Isn't that sweet? Yeah. The only thing I don't like about the motivations is it, it kind of ruins, it spoils the ending a bit. Because most of the endings are basically that, like whatever it says on their tracks, that is like the ending. Give yeah. or take. It's cute though. It's cute. I thought yeah. it was cool. Well, I, I liked. Um, I liked how they did it both ways. You had the tournament setting, which was in the Channel Six, you know, interview style with the whole thing, and then the story mode. That's where uh, April and Splinter are both kidnapped immediately by the Shredder elite. Yeah. Um. Which it goes into what you were saying earlier, like the premise is that Shredder's been defeated before or whatever, yeah. and now the Shredder Elite is coming in doing something. Karai's back for revenge, and you know, I was just like the characters. They're like, who is this Karai? I didn't know either at that time, so I was right there with them, the whole mystery of it all. So you get halfway through the story mode, and then uh, if the characters you fight, it's different order every time. There's variables there. Um yeah. And then you halfway through, you rescue uh, April first, and then Splinter. Yeah, um, and then you got to fight Karai, and then it's, it's happily ever after, and everything. No. Uh, so yeah, it's cool. It is basically in that respect. You know, you give you a lot of reason to play the game twice. There's some differences. Like you couldn't use your super move in story mode. I thought that was balls because that was part of the fun of playing the game was doing those super moves and those special moves. You couldn't do them in the, the stories. That was kind of a bummer. And also, you can only pick the turtles. You couldn't pick anyone else. Yeah, yeah, you, you can look with the four turtles. And they had pre-fight dialogue, which I always thought was kind of cool. I yeah. mean, it reminded me of Art of Fighting back then. They had little things to say to each other before they fight. I and like that. You beat Chrome Dome, and he's like, your friends are not here. In fact, I'm not even sure where here is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but interestingly enough, Asuka had her own thing. Asuka just came in to challenge people, I guess. And I think one of the things that was kind of like, you know, where's the Shredder Elite or whatever? And Asuka's like, I'm not interested in making you join some silly little group. I'm here to, to fight or whatever. So even she had her own separate motivation. She had nothing to do with the Elite, <laughs> beat the Elite, right? Uh, she uh, had her own motives and all that. Yeah. I mean, it was, I have some... it was oh. cool. I liked, I liked how they managed to kind of Get everybody in there and give them a reason to be there, sort of, you know. It was, and it was almost like getting two different games, having being able to play the story mode and the arcade mode. And each the arcade mode did have a story to it, in a sense. So, you know, it was cool. Yeah. A lot of you could play against the computer, against your friend, or you know, they had a, a watch mode where you just watch the computer fight. So, they definitely they put a lot into the game for what it was. That was neat. I'm just wondering about the whole it's the thing with the Rat King that was like the champion or whatever. The main <laughs> thing that popped in my head was what reason would he have to leave the sewer to go and participate in a tournament to begin with? And furthermore, he's the defending champion, so that means that he's already won this once before. Which means the winner, they said, in the game itself, it tells you uh, the winner is going to get more money than they could possibly imagine. So uh, we know. So okay, there's a revelation. Low key, Rat King's a bazillionaire. Uh, <laughs> no, no. 
fall out. So it's like all we've ever seen of this dude is that he lives in the sewers, he wraps himself in rags and bandages. But now I have these knowing, knowing he's the defending tournament fighters champion and therefore also a bazillionaire. I've got these images in my head now of Rat King, like he's way out in Cali sipping pina coladas at his giant mansion he's still wearing the rags and everything but like you know he's at like hugh hefner mansion and he's just been chilling out there all year and then he comes back uh when they do the new tournament he's like those I mean, he, he, he could be in the sewers to avoid paying taxes right that that's what uh, i'm saying that's, that's like, yeah, he's, like, he's that's, avoiding taxes don't let the rags fool you the rags are from actually from the uh, kanye yeezy collection so, <laughs> and the area about Rat King is that he's totally jacked in this game, and he has a oh, fucking geez. suplex and the Rat Bomber type thing. And I'm like, that's the only thing missing. I would have really loved in Shredder's Revenge as a callback, because Rat King grabs you, he basically grabs you, spins you around, and throws you across the screen. But I would have been cracking up if he did a fucking suplex in that game, just to kind of call back the tournament fires. Either the suplex or the or the Rat uh, the Rat Bomber thing. He's got I mean, that. he's already overly jacked. He looks like a mummified Brock Lesnar as it is. Don't make, don't give him the suplex, dude. Come on, man. And another thing that that's uh, no, but he already, yeah, he already does it in the game. One thing I noticed, I believe both. No, I don't know. Rat King, I don't think ever does his special, does he? I think Karai in some case, okay, because she basically Karai just spanks the fuck out of you with her air things, you know. Yeah, I think in very that. rare occasions she does do the super on you, but I don't think Rat King ever does his super. I don't remember him doing it, but he's uh, like, because there is some code to use them, and when you use them, obviously you can do their moves, and that's his super. He just glows like this big energy orb, and obviously it hits you if you're close. But I don't think the, I've uh, ever seen him do it. He mostly just does the jump kick over and over again, and if you get close to him, he does the rap bomber thing. And what is with his voice too? Or a bomba? Like he sounds like <laughs> Ivan Drago. Yeah. Like what the fuck? <laughs> I will crush you. <laughs> you. You have disrespected my rats. I must break you. <laughs> like, how shitty was the last tournament fighters tournament that Rat King ended up being the champion? Like, uh, probably just a bunch of jobbers. Yeah, well, the turtles right. were probably too busy eating pizza or some bull. You see that? That probably happened. While how the turtles were busy with that? turtles in time, Rat King was winning the tournament. That's why they never got involved. They were busy going through time and fighting Shredder and the Statue of Liberty and shit. I was going to say, this is at least the second one based on what the game tells you. So how did they miss the first one entirely? They must have been busy. <laughs> yeah. That's all I can think of. Yeah, it's a good I point. wanted to it's say the Manhattan thing. Project. Yeah, but right. I, like I like the time travel thing a bit better. Or a Hyperstone heisting it. <laughs> yeah, that one ain't bad either. But Yeah, I mean, like, uh, I'm trying to see if there's anything I didn't really go over here. My cheater notes. Yeah, it's like... Uh, we talked about the backgrounds, the finishing moves, you know, really awesome, cool stuff there. Uh, you know, if I had any complaints, really, I just wish the roster was a little bit bigger. Or there's a couple characters, like I said, you know, it feels wrong. It just feels wrong not having Casey or Splinter or even like Slash, you know, some of those characters be playable. So, I mean, maybe you could have swapped out War and Armagon and Asuka. You know, maybe I would have taken those three out and put in, like, Casey and Slash and maybe Splinter. But, yeah, a lot of people say Bebop and Rocksteady. That's cool, too. I would have replaced, because I like Armagon, though. I would have replaced War with uh, with Slash, because that had been awesome. But I think maybe they felt it was just too many turtles. Because that's the weak spot about the, about the turtles. There's four of them. They all have to be in there. So every time there's a game, it's always like, well, there goes four slots. You know what I mean? Because you got to have all four of them in there, you know? See, if they did another one, yeah, you would add like characters like Casey, you know, Rock, Steady, Bebop, things like that. But what if we had like a hidden Akuma character? So like, let's say you know you go to beat Cry, and then after the second round, you know, we really do some ugly crossover, and Usagi Ojimbo pops out. Oh, oh wow! <laughs> you know, the freaking oh, Samurai Rabbit just comes out, and challenges you. You know, like that would have been cool. That would have been insane. I would have lost it if I would have saw that. <laughs> Although Slash, though, I would love Slash. Cause I would have loved it if his wind pose was turning around like Akuma does. That would have been cool. The thing about Slash is that he is one of the characters that was literally way too cool for the cartoon show. 
Like the actual action figure, he's got sharp teeth, he's got the claws, he looks like you know, he's good, like he looks like a fucking maniac, you know what I mean? But uh, yeah, like Turtles in Time. <laughs> the, the, yeah, in Turtles in Time, he looks exactly like the figure, and so does um in uh, Manhattan Project. But then like in the cartoon, it make him stupid, he has buck teeth. I guess I don't know, a black bandana's too too much for kids nowadays. It's getting like a yeah, weird right. metal thing, and like I don't know, his design was goofy. Um, I, I kind of wish the, the Turtles game, since it's based on the cartoon, they, they did base Slash on that version, you know? Well, kind of a weird mixture between the cartoon and the action figure, but um, at least in the Archie comics, he looked like that. But yeah, it's a thing. He's just, he was that one character that was just too hardcore for that cartoon. I yeah, think. right? But everybody loved him, you know? It was like, it was always cool when they would show up in something, but, you know, it was always like a little bit different, a little bit tweaked. Uh, one thing we we only mentioned briefly, like, okay, so here's something that actually has a weird link between the Super Nintendo and the Genesis versions of the game, is that they both rely on a storyline plot with there being clones of the Turtles, because like many games, you know, at some point during the arcade mode or tournament mode in this, you end up fighting a clone of yourself. Uh, in this case, you know, if you're a turtle, you fight your, your clone version of yourself. And then, like, in the Genesis version, that's the whole plot of the game. Like, the whole yeah. plot of the game is that there's these evil turtle clones, and they they kidnapped Splinter, and they took him off, and you got to go fight to get him back. So it's weird. They both use this clone turtle subplot, but they do it totally differently. In the SNES version, it's just an excuse to have a mirror match, whereas in the Genesis version, it's the entire point of the game. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, and not only that, but again, it follows that weird trend. Like, like this game doesn't, the Genesis version doesn't go into much detail, but it's noticeable that Shredder's not in the game. So it takes place sometime after. And again, Karai's the final boss of that one, too, you know. So that one real quick had the Turtles, April O'Neil looking like Blaze from Streets of Rage for whatever reason, uh, yeah, Casey you. Jones, uh, Sissy Fuss, which is a made-up character, which yeah, again, he was another made-up character. He wasn't like whatever. That that was that was dumb. I don't know the reason between that one. And um, well, who else? I think that was the only play. Oh, uh, Man Ray, who they call Ray Filet. For me, always used to. I think I mentioned it one time with other guys. I don't know if you were you were here with us during the, like the pre-game show. But I was talking about um, when Man Ray was first introduced. He was introduced to one of those little comics that came with the Ninja Turtle serials back then. Mm -hmm. But um, and in the Archie comics, it was also called Man Ray at first. But then when he released the action figure, for whatever reason, they called him Ray Filet, and that stuck. So the game calls him Ray Filet. And then you fight the bosses, which are Triceraton, Krang's android body, and Karai. And which is weird because Karai in the SNES version straight up look like the Mirage version. Which is interesting because nowadays Karai is always associated with black colors, while in the uh, in the SNES version, she has like the reddish colors, like like in the comic and everything, the full design and all that. But it gave her like this weird, I don't know, kind of armor thing in the Genesis version that was not from the comics. It was kind of interesting. And um, yeah, so that plot was born into Dimension X. So each level was some gross looking planet thing because yeah. it was different Dimension X things. Yeah, like, they had a whole different style. Like, the Super Nintendo version, it had a few stages, like, you're on Mount Olympus in the one stage, and, and you're, like, a sunken ship. So there's a couple fantastical stages, but most of the game is very street-level. Uh, there's yeah. the back alley, there's the scrapyard, there's the steelworks, you're in a diner, you're on a concert stage, you're on a rooftop, but it's, like, very terrestrial. Whereas the Genesis version of Tournament Fighters you're going to all these different alien landscapes because you're in Dimension X and you're going to all these alien type of places and situations. It was like, it's weird. It's like, the only thing they have in common is that it's a fighting game starring the Ninja Turtles. Everything else is different, up to and including the fact that the Super Nintendo version is pretty good. The Genesis version is pretty shit. That game pisses me off to no end. And it really sucks because back then... Konami always meant, you know, a good turtle game. I mean, mine is my very in the first NES game. I know some people love it and whatever, but but usually when you buy a Konami turtle game, it was a good game. This one sucked balls. It pissed me the fuck off. The controls were, were terrible. Um, the voices were terrible, even you know, even though Genesis, whatever. Um, the gameplay, just the moves barely come out. 
there's this weird split second delay every time your character falls that is you know knocked down there's this weird split second delay before they flick back up to their feet and the computer knows how to spam that to keep knocking your ass down i hated that shit and casey jones has this move where he just swings his golf thing golf club for, for like like a split second and you're invincible during that split second you know the computer version does it fucking non-stop that you think it's like a long move but no it, it was I hate that game. And the Triceraton was the worst, most annoying boss because he had a, a hole that's like a long hole. He fucking bites you and it feels like it's forever, then drops you, then fucking stomps. That's part of the same move and stomps on you. It, oh, of course. It, it just pissed me off. And that was one of the few games that I gave back to the store because whenever I buy a game, I always love it or I always, you know, I like put up with it or whatever. But no, that one, Johnny and I, Back to the store. Fucking game sub. We were pissed off. It just... Oh, I only no. played it long enough to say that at least I beat it once to see the ending or whatever, but after that, no, get the shit out of my fucking house. You know, but the yeah. Genesis version has a taunt button. I mean, yeah, but point. that doesn't save it. doesn't matter. Like, like, honestly, the sound was terrible. The, the frame rate for the characters was so glitchy, and the moves were so bad. All right, Ricky, I'm going to go old school with this. I would rather be playing one of those little LGN Tiger handheld versions of this game before I would touch <laughs> wow. the Genesis version ever again. You and we're going to get the Call Bunga collection. Oh, no. <laughs> Four Actually, batteries, I... kiss my butt. I'm done. I That's right, the Game of want... episode, me and Johnny are doing a thing where, like, like dude, the Call of Bunga collection is coming out. And he's like, oh, wow, all the old games, yeah, including the SNES version of Tournament Fire, yeah, and the Genesis version. He's like, oh, no. <laughs> I got to be honest. I've actually, if I played the Genesis one ever, it was once. I really don't remember if I ever even did, but I've heard nothing but bad things. Um, I'm actually looking forward to the Calabunga collection just to kind of fiddle with it and see. But I remember, as I mentioned, a magazine called Game Players came out with the review of both versions of the game right when it came out. And, and they were like a couple <coughs> pages apart, and they really built up the uh, Super Nintendo one, and they trashed the Genesis one. They're like, it's slow. <laughs> And they're like it's if it has anything over the SNES version, they say there's a couple characters, maybe like Casey, that you'd prefer to see over somebody like War, but like it just doesn't look, sound, or play any good. I mean, they built it around the Genesis three button controller, which is already like it's a fighting game. You can't do it with three buttons, you know. I mean, Super Nintendo. They managed to do pretty good only using the four face buttons, so that's okay. But on the Genesis, they had to use three buttons, and one of them is your taunt. So it's like that's a waste. I, like, and even, it's one of those games where even if you plug in a six button controller, it doesn't do it. <clears throat> so you're still only using three buttons. So it's not like you get any extra leeway or it maps the strong and weak attacks differently. No, you still only use the three main buttons. So. Uh, it was just like what I read was that the Super Nintendo version had a much bigger budget and a much longer development cycle. Oh. That's what I heard. I know they were both in development at the same time and they both came out at the same time. But I heard that Konami just treated the Super Nintendo version like their prized son and the Genesis version was like the bastard. That's so the right headed stepchild. Yeah, that's what I've been led to believe. I don't know. All I know is that they each have a legacy, and the Super Nintendo version is one that people remember fondly in spite of some of its flaws, but the Genesis one is one where people go, oh, jeez, that piece of shit. Like, Sega Lord X, like, uh, on his channel, he's pretty nice about most things, but he skewered the Genesis Tournament Fighters uh, to a degree I almost never have heard him speak so poorly of any game. But he's oh, I gotta watch that. that. Uh, Johnny, any any uh, delightful memories of the Genesis version? Um, not really. Just the graphics are horrible. So what I can remember is that the graphics are really small compared to the SNES. Very grainy. The background looks really disgusting as well. Gross and it's dark and it's just like, oh, what is this crap? 
it's really a shame that you know Sega always went along with the slogan Sega Genesis does when Nintendo don't. Obviously, it could not make a better. Oh well, well technically it couldn't make a better um tur- uh, tournament fighters game. So Sega was right. Okay. Now one thing is um oh two more things to mention. Uh, one thing is that this game had like. Um, some stages had breakable uh, ground, like breakable floors to expose like another level, kind of like similar to X-Men versus Street Fighter. So that was kind of interesting. And the other thing is that they had fatalities or special, you know, finishing moves in the game, which were fucking impossible to do. The instruction book had on, you know, all these different arrows. Like I could never do them. And I forgot what the conditions were. The only one that stands out to me of all of them, because most of them were just like, you know, super rare, was Leonardo, which, I, you know, it makes sense for the Mirage Turtles, but, you know, you know, we're more used to the 80s cartoon. Leonardo knocks you up, and when you fall, you land on his sword. You, he basically impales you, which is kind of odd, you know, at least for back then. I know that that's not too outlandish for the Mirage comics, but back then with the 80s cartoon and stuff, you're like, damn, we all got pissed in this shit. You know what I mean? Like... <laughs> I like it. 